Thanks, gloves. Interesting description of self-proclaimed when it came out of your mouth. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as gloves said, I started for Berg about a year ago. Got told to pack a suitcase and jump on my Subaru. And after a few laps around Australia, seem to have come back here with just a suitcase and myself. <laughs> so today I'm talking. My slide is chasing unicorns, but basically in the RAM industry and from travelling around. Um, we're always looking for the perfect RAM, um, and so far I haven't found it, Berg hasn't found it, no one's found it, but we're trying to make tools um, that can help us breed or create a RAM that's more profitable for each of our enterprises. And the fact of the matter is, is that that unicorn for each person's place here is probably looking slightly different. So, I was kind of told not to ask too many questions when I'm up here, but I don't listen to instructions very well. So. I wanted to see where you guys start and how you pick ramps to match your breeding objectives. What are some of the things you guys look at? Is it the catalogue, phenotypically, um, when selecting a ram? Don't all go at once. Feed and structure. Feed and structure, yep. EBVs, any in particular? Yep, so EBVs first and then go assess the animal. Yep, so sorting through the catalogue beforehand. Wool? Wool? Right, is anyone using an index? Don't all throw your hands up again. Not too many pretty wools. Not all like Ferg then. Right, so using indexes. So, the point of indexes is a lot of times, well, if you see traditionally in the sheep industry, we've selected on one or two traits and gotten ourselves into a lot of trouble and ended up with an unbalanced animal. So the original point of indexes was to make a balanced genetic gain and make sure or decrease that risk of single trait selection. So um, because obviously there's negatively correlated traits with each trait you select. So thankfully Chad covered a bit earlier. If you're not looking at your breech wrinkle, you're going to have a lot of other traits associated with that. Um, and similar thing, if you're just chasing fleece weight, there's a lot of traits that are correlated with that, that if you're not watching carefully, those traits are gonna move in another direction. So indexes were originally created to try and balance those traits. Um, so I'll just run through some of the indexes we've got at the moment, and I think we might find why some of them are not so widely uptaken. So this is one of the first ones. I don't know how well you can see at the back, but this is the Fiber Production Plus. And what's on here is the um, weightings of the index. So the top 10% of the animals that come through when using that index. So the top 10% of animals for FP Plus have 45, cut 45% more wool and a 37% finer. And apparently have 10% more, more lambs weaned while having a little weighting on staple length, staple strength. So, that's the weighting for the FP plus. So as an index, that index is looking at about basically two traits um, and just completely weighting them. We switch over to the Merino production indexes, so the MP and the MP plus. These indexes are really heavily weighted on fleece weight and then a little bit on fibre diameter and a little bit on yielding weight. Once again, pretty dominated by one trait. And then if we move to our dual production indexes, which is what um, it's probably closest to of the sheep genetics indexes to what we're breeding for well, for a lot of our clients and here. So using clean fleece weight, trying to hold fibre diameter, a little bit of yearling weight, and then trying to push reproduction, and only a little bit on eye muscle depth. So the issue with these indexes is that it's pretty hard well, it, to take one index and use it as a blanket and go, right, this index is going to be perfect for all environments across Australia and New Zealand. So you can see just on the slide here, we've got a lot of different environments. There's people here today from four states and some very different production systems. Um, so I'm sure the genetics that go, that'll work well in Victoria, where at the moment it's about negative three and blowing a gale, are probably pretty different to what's going to be in central Queensland, where it's 35 and sunny. So, um, as I said, what works here 
won't work necessarily there. So we can't just throw a blanket rule index that's waiting three or four trades and expect it to produce in every environment in Australia. So there's more than one trade we're looking for. So as I said, one thing that affects what we're looking for in our genetics is the environment that we're managing our sheep in. The other thing is actually our management system. So you could compare yourself to your neighbour or even across the hill here, and you could be running completely different genetics and management systems. So what works here may not even necessarily work right next door, as you can see by this little colour on the screen. Um, so that's the big part about indexes, is if two people say one next door is trying to finish lambs at 12 months of age or nine months of age for a weather kill, or one person selling wieners straight off mum, those people are going to have different um, genetic objectives for where they want their growth rates to sit. Um, similar, similar thing, if one person is, say, in Victoria, he's, he might have a high worm burden or trench resistance, so he's going to have to place a larger emphasis on worm meat count than, say, someone out at Tottenham, where Dave's from. So, a lot of these things, um, our environment and our management systems, affect what genetics we should be chasing. So, after just degrading indexes quickly, there is a light at the end of the tunnel because we've decided we'll develop a tool of our own. <laughs> so, between a couple of scientists, a few economic models, and one opinionated Excel nerd, we got together and decided we'd start to create a next-gen index. So, as you saw before, uh, the traditional indexes are base, basically weighting two to four traits. Um, in this index, we've weighted uh, 17 traits, but we have the capacity to weight up to 32 traits, um, and in the future, probably more. So, we're trying to take in uh, and weight a lot more traits to build that more balanced modern merino that we hear so often. Um, so, if this doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know why you're sitting back there looking at me like you've just seen a ghost. <laughs> so this here is the weightings that we've got from the Next Gen Index. So you can see there's the 17 traits that we've got down the side. So basically, from sitting sitting down, we decided that yearling weight, or oh, sorry, yearling weight for a lot of people is too late. If you're trying to join new lambs or if you're trying to finish weathers, you want them finishing it around at nine months of age generally or even earlier. So we put a lot more emphasis on weaning weight and P weight and then a negative emphasis on adult weight. So I should just say quickly that uh, this here is the top 10% of animals that this index pulls up in the sheep genetics database compared to the average. So those animals are basically five, 6% better for weaning weight and P weight but then back to a only 4% higher for their adult weight. So we're trying to breed those animals that have an early punch and then plateau out. So the way we're going to do this also is we know that's got a correlation with fat and muscle. So we put a large emphasis on fat and muscle to help cap that adult weight and breed for that genetic condition score. Um, the sheep genetics average for fleece weight sits at around that 17, so we're quite happy to keep that where it is. So. Um, basically, we've got it so we're holding fleece weight and fibre diameter. It may look like it's going up slightly, but once again, the industry average is negative one, and it's pretty hard to make a generic index and go when there's people with breeding objectives of down to 16 micron or even lower, right through to 22 or even 40 in some of the composites. So we tried to make one that was quite generic sit around 18.5, 19 microns, so we're quite happy if that yearling and adult fibre diameter is sitting about there slightly higher than negative one, so it's probably going to be sitting at 0 0.7, 0 0.8, negative that is. Um, we've got a negative emphasis on YDCV, so that's correlated with whole body energy um, and fat, so, and then also reproduction, so that's actually it may look like it's weighted heavily there, but due to the traits we've weighted, that's kind of come along for the ride. Uh, stable strength, we've um, put a slight weighting on stable strength. Wex obviously coming back. Quite a large emphasis on the, on the breach traits. Looks there like um, covers quite high, but we've put more of an emphasis on DAG. And if you're in 
so where Dave is, you're probably going to want more of an emphasis on wrinkle and cover because you mightn't be in a daggy environment. But if you're in Victoria at the moment, where in winter um, everything's under a pretty heavy dag load, you're going to want dag's probably nearly as important, if not more, than wrinkles. So you're going to want a lot, a lot larger emphasis on it. And then we've split up the three new reproduction traits. So for anyone here who hasn't been following sheep genetics recently, um, NLW, which is number of lambs weaned, has recently changed to weaning rate. So it's on a new analysis system. And that weaning rate is made up of conception, litter size, and new rearing ability. So we've split those three up and we've tried to put more heavily a weighting on conception and new rearing ability, but due to the fertility of the animals that we brought up in the top 10%, it actually made them all quite equal um, in their weightings at around 5%. We put a little emphasis on maternal weaning weight because everyone's trying to make, trying to breed a maternal merino and we don't really want that going negative. And then we put an um, emphasis on fleece rot. So I'm sure most people here, especially if you're in New South Wales this year, have experienced um, a pretty wet year and driving up through Bork yesterday, we nearly needed a boat. So there's been a fairly heavy emphasis on fleece rot and colour this year, so we put um, a negative yeah, weighting on that. But once again, if you're out, say, at hay, you might need that emphasis on that, so we can take that out. Um, you may think there, there's a few um, traits on there that we've left out, such as the eating quality traits or the uh, like shear force and IMF. Um, we're trying to make this for the commercial producer at the moment, so until those premiums are there and we've got people in Moreno sending animals in to get killed and tested for those traits, we're probably um, quite happy to leave them out. It doesn't mean we're not focusing on those traits with our sub producers. So, for example, if we're making an index for Mumblebone, you can see they're quite focused on keeping those eating quality traits in check, so we'll weight those. Um, traits when we're working with them. This one here is just a generic index and once again I'm not saying this is perfect but we think it's a good step in the right direction and that we'll probably be changing it in the future if there are premiums in that space. How much time do I have? Does anyone have any questions on this before I go on? No? Keep okay, going. Oh, I've got time. Sure. All right. Anyone got any questions while I've got this on the board? None. No one's as excited as I am. Cool. <laughs> Here we go. Yes, yes we can. So I'll be talking about it in my next slide is that we can change the weightings on each one of these traits to suit individual farmers. So as I've been saying, if you're, so where you guys are in a high rainfall environment, you might want more of an emphasis on worms and, and dag, and maybe if you've had um, heavy pressure on your walls, you might want more, more on fleece rot. So we can put all those weightings in. If you're finishing um, animals for a kill job, you might want a bit more weighting on early growth. So for individual producers, we can, we can change the weightings on that index. And as I'm saying, for stud producers, we can change it to perfectly fit their breeding objective. Yes. Yep, so what we've got it at the moment is we've got it, the range is between 219 and um, 104 maybe. So it's, based, it's very similar to the other indexes in um, the scale of it, so all the animals are sitting between there. Um, what animals come to the top is quite different because we've included such a large number of traits, it's really biased towards studs that have actually recorded, gone out and measured all of these traits. Um, so it's been really good and hopefully it's going to encourage a lot of producers, if they want to rank well in this index, to start measuring those traits. Um, because, I don't know, I'm happy to be argued against, but I, I think every trait on this board is important in the modern merino. Um, so, yeah, hopefully once we start rolling this index out, um, more people start recording more traits and because a stud like here has recorded a lot of traits, we checked the rams out there last night and nearly 50% of those rams were in the top 5%, which I think would sit quite differently to other industry indexes. I 
って。<笑>
Um, we're also hoping in the future to put things like foot rod in there um, for people in Victoria or these poor Victorians, they're copying hammering. Um, we can also bring Tasmanians into that, but <laughs> not that Australia has any foot rot. And another use for this index is we can rank raw data for commercial enterprises. So as the use of EID ramps up, we're finding people are starting and wanting to use that technology and record more data on their youth block. You can see Dave Gregg's got 4,000 odd years and he's putting up ones on the screen that he basically knows by name. That's the power of EID. If you record stuff, you can be picking those years that are performing every time. So it's really handy in ranking raw data for commercial enterprises. We've been doing a bit of this where we get, say, growth, um, what the scanning of those years were, what their condition score is at each joining, and then we can create a ranking for those years when we're classing. And so all we're doing is we're assess assessing the U based on its phenotypic merit, but we've also just got a ranking in front of it. So that's where I see one of the big advantages for this index is actually in classing, so combining that raw data that you can collect pretty easily through EID with the phenotypic um, look of the animal. So I didn't want to throw too many numbers up today. Sorry, gloves. Disappoint me. I hope you're still following, by the way. Um, but I did think I'd put this up. So here I've got the average da average. Um, of a few traits of the sale day rams that are out in the pen. And I ranked them on the index and pulled out the top 10%. So you can see that the top 10% have about two kilos more growth, nearly half a mil more fat and muscle, um, pretty consistent on fleece weight. They're slightly finer. They've got a lot lower CV, they're higher in stable strength, a lot lower worm count. They're slightly plainer. They've got a lot less dag. Most importantly, they've got a higher weaning rate. And then that last one on the end there is fleece rot, so they're also um, going to withstand weather better. So um, you can see that this index is really handy in trying to pull out the top performing animals. So just to tease you even more, I grabbed the five top ranked animals that are out there today. I don't know if you want to go have a look at these, but I know I already have. I've already done it. so. You can see here that the top five animals that's pulled out, I know I'd be pretty content bringing a trailer here and taking any of those home. Um, so I know it's lunchtime now and I've probably held you up for long enough, but I just wanted to say good luck going out there and chasing those unicorns because even this one's not right with its front passing down. <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, thanks, Henry. Anyone got any questions for Henry? Um, hold all your Excel questions till lunch. He'll quite happily get his computer out. But any questions? Uh, no, I just want to say I've sat. Oh, sorry. Go. Um, what, what, um, what kind of effect does the rain have on the percentage of the actual accuracy of the speed that may actually be um, What's the correlation? How does that relate to the strength that you give that? Yeah, so at the moment, um, because even if it's got a low accuracy, that estimated breeding value is the best estimate of where it sits, so we're not actually worried about the accuracies. And if you're going to, say, pick a ram team of those five animals, even if the accuracies are low, um, if you buy five rams, the chances are that they, they're going to throw to the average. So it's probably more important if you're just trying to pick one ram, but what we're hoping this index will really help with is picking a ram team and bringing up the top animals that will help maximise profitability at your enterprise. So then you can pick a team that's got an average EBVs. Um, and also sheep genetics aren't displaying any more um, breeding bays for animals that don't, they have a threshold for accuracy. So we won't be out. So those traits just won't be included in the um, index if they don't come through. Anyone else?